In this episode, we're answering some of our listener questions. They're your questions. We'll be covering evidence for different growth rates within a suburb, first home buyers in their 40s and the critical decisions that they need to make, a little bit different from anyone in their younger years. Uh, are apartments ever better than houses? And lifestyle compounds and resort style complexes, are these investment grade? And at the end, a little bit of a philosophical discussion around affordability. Welcome to The Elephant in the Room. This is the podcast where we love to talk about the big things in property that never usually get talked about. I'm Veronica Morgan, real estate agent, buyer's agent, co-host of Foxtel's Location, Location, Location Australia and author of Auction Ready. And I'm Chris Bates, mortgage broker. Before we get started, I need to let you know that nothing we say on here can be taken as personal advice. We always recommend you engage the services of a professional. Don't forget that you can access the transcript for this episode on the website as well as download our free full or forecaster report which experts can you trust to get it right the elephant in the room.com.au let's kick off with our first question i'm amazed actually the standard of question that we have is pretty impressive and the and, well the way in which people are thinking and i i'm so heartened by the depth and the way that people are actually really looking at their their property decisions. And so, you know, this first one from Miriam is a great example of a really good thinking question, right? So she starts off, it's a couple of layers of this question, but you often talk about different properties in the same area having very different capital growth trajectories and emphasizing that this is why you need to choose the right asset. Have you done an episode presenting the evidence for this hypothesis? If not, it would be great if you could. Well, we sort of have, and I'll come to that in a minute. She says she'd love some more data useful for others in her circumstance rather than the archetype that you usually talk to. And this is a bit of a surprise, 20s going to get married and have kids. Now that's because that's what Chris talks to all the time. I'm not always talking to that younger demographic. Um, Miriam is in her 40s. Now, first of all, we did do an episode where we actually talked a lot about this and that was a Suburb Trends episode July this year. Uh, you remember that episode, Chris? Oh, around the sort of different quality of assets in terms of well, around the data behind demonstrating that um, different properties in one location can perform differently over time. So just to give you a bit of background, I could see this just happening in, in my business. You know, I've been just looking at properties and saying, oh, God, how come that one, those people made so much more money over that period of time than somebody else? And so I sought to actually go and find some evidence to prove this. And this was back in... Uh, probably a good 10 years ago and I looked back at I just chose Roselle as a suburb and I and I looked at a bunch of properties that sold in one period and then over a period of time compared their sale prices because they sold again so basically it was they'd sold in 2004 and then on sold in 2011 or 10 and the reason I went that long that long period of time in which they could on sell was because it was a very flat period of growth so there wasn't a lot of market forces to distort the the um the data. And I could see that um, some properties had performed under the median for the area and some had performed above the median. And I'm like, well, what is it about the individual properties that would lead them some to underperform and some to overperform? And it wasn't about renovation because none of these properties had been renovated. They all had been sold in the same condition both times. So that was where I started my own personal journey to say, okay, well, let's let's try to uncover this. And, and a lot of it is anecdotal and all based on case studies. And so in the Suburb Trends episode in July when we we met with Kent Lardner, he came back to us with the repeat sales index, which is really just a, a, a data scientist's way of actually being able to look on a, on a bigger scale at the same sort of data. Um, and so, you know, what did we discover there, Chris? I mean, we discovered that there were some, some key uh, examples, but the, basically that's just pure evidence that this is true that you can have some properties sell in the same period of time, the same suburbs, and some will make more money than others. Simple. Yeah, I think it's, um, you've got a, a properties part science and you can look at the, try to figure it out based on these factors and I'm gonna buy in this suburb and you're gonna get this type of growth. But I think it's, a lot of it's the art part of it. And, you know, and that's the sort of 
when you're going on the ground, you can see why one property is way more desirable than another. Um, and I think that's the biggest thing you've got to do with this is yes, you can go and find the data and find these evidence things, but it's actually on the ground within a suburb, within certain streets, you can see why certain pockets will be way more desirable than other pockets and attract a different type of buyer. Um, people within the suburb will want to buy in those streets. People um, who are moving to that suburb would much prefer to be in those streets. You know, there's always something, there's something called the waterfront index. And this is a very clear, you know, example of where, you know, the properties that are right on the waterfront, the way that they rise versus the properties that are, you know, the street behind. And you can definitely find data on that. But I think it's just, you need your common sense here to think, okay, well, actually, these properties, there's none of them. They can't build any more of them. And most of the money's in the land, the thing that goes up. And these properties, well, they're building lots more of them. They're aging, and most of my money's going in the building that's going down. And over time, um, you can absolutely go back and look at that suburb. It's really easy to do. You've just got to get your own, um, you know, your research on and start looking within the suburb. And um, you can get access to RP data. There's lo even domain and real estate and on the house have pretty good data on certain streets. And you can just go through and say, well, okay, look at the houses and annualize that growth rate and look at this street. And um, absolutely, you will find that the better streets, the better sides of the street, the things that have got better aspect um, will be growing at a higher compound rate. Now, the problem with this sort of strategy is that when it really shows is when the market's um, not hot, but when the market's really struggling. And I, the way I learned all this was literally doing that work. I remember going back in 2012 and you know, pro producing presentations around sort of uh, Bondi Junction where I was working at the time and looking at the apartments versus the houses and the houses had quadrupled over that period and the apartments had gone up twice. Um, and so I think what, what it really shows is like 2018. You know, 2018, we really saw that the properties that were compromised, things that had bad streets, the dark privacy issues, fell a lot further than the, the best assets in the street. So I know it's you probably want some real data and show that, but it's really case by case study on every different suburb you need to do and the suburb that you're looking to buy and see what's scarce and you'll find that those have been rising faster than the things that they're building more of. I think, too, that, um, you know, a question is good. It says, have you done so presenting the evidence for this hypothesis? So it's not actually a hypothesis. It actually actually is borne out all the time. So it started as a hypothesis. Then the research showed that it to be true. And so as Chris is saying, local knowledge, understanding what local buyers want, the, the particular um, attraction of certain streets and types of architecture, et cetera, et cetera, and then looking at how those properties will grow in value over time versus those that don't have those attributes. But there's another really great way of actually evidence that supports the hypothesis, if you want to call it that, and that is stratified medians. If you go into, um, I think it's, I think both, if you look in domain or realestate.com, or if you look at Kent Suburb Trends website, and you actually look at the stratified medians, um, you can actually go and see per suburb, particularly in domain and, and uh, real estate, you can actually go and look and it says like, you know, if, if there's a diversity of stock, if there's four bedroom, if there are houses for starters and then there's apartments. Yeah. If there's houses, you go four bedroom, three bedroom, two bedroom and so on. And same with apartments. And you can actually see the medians for each of those types of property, right? And then if you start tracking those, you will start to see evidence of what we're talking about here. Some of those segments of the market had different median prices and different median growth rates. Um, and it all comes back to that popularity, what's in the greatest demand and what has the greatest amount of scarcity. So that there is evidence for this hypothesis. It isn't just us Posture, posturing and saying this is what should happen. This is actually the truth. Now, the next part of her question is, I'm a first home buyer, early 40s, buying by your, herself. I'd like to choose an asset that gives me options in the future, but I don't have a long runway and I want options for retirement rather than children. For people like me, a house is out of reach unless you move to the city outskirts. And I'm trying to work out whether there are apartments that will grow at the same rate that a house will in a beachside location near my family. In theory, top floor apartments seem to have the privacy, northerly sun, greenery and views that make a place pleasant to live in. 
and also much nicer than the villa unit, which seems like it will grow faster. And the fact she's used the term villa unit says to me she's in Melbourne. Um, in practice, what's on the market seems very much investor stock, small and on main roads. What she's seeing in Blackrock, yes, yeah, she is in Melbourne. Um, and now in suburbs, she's looking at other suburbs between, Bo- Bo- how do you say it, Beaumaris? Bo Morris yep. and Elwood to see if I can find some with higher quality options. Now, in all this is there is a belief in Australia that apartments don't do as well as houses. And once again, if you really want to start looking at the stratified medians, if you want to sort of get into the evidence, what you're talking about earlier to say, well, in certain suburbs, certain types of apartments, you could actually start tracking that against, say, houses in outer areas. You could actually do that research yourself to work out, well, what is what is happening? What's the comparison? But certainly within inner areas... So inner urban areas where land is land is scarce or beachside areas or any area that's that's basically hemmed in by water or a mountain <laughs> or some sort of geography um, where you've got small complexes, where you've got older complexes, where you've got limited demand, uh, sorry, limited um, uh, development, all of those things point towards apartments having the potential to perform very, very well. And certainly if you're buying in a de- in an area where the demographic lends itself to wanting to live in smaller properties. And so you talk about why would you go and buy in a in a big in an area where there's big houses and everyone's buying for a family? Like wh- why would you do that for yourself? But also, you know, there are other people like you out there that don't want to have live in those sort of houses and they don't need to because they're not thinking about kids. So it's really about making sure that you looking at you're looking in areas where there are P- PLUs you know people like us and other and and all of those things I mentioned earlier about scarcity and a lack of supply apartments can do very very well if you get all the magic elements right yeah I think that the challenge we had Stuart Weems on the podcast and he's um you know had a lot of clients who have bought apartments and we did a, a bit of a discussion him and I around Melbourne in particular and apartments and Melbourne apartments have performed nowhere near as good as Sydney apartments, for example. The same as Brisbane, you know, um, Adelaide, Perth, pretty much everywhere in the country besides Sydney, apartments haven't really gone up anywhere near as much as Sydney. Now, the reason Sydney's have gone up is because house prices have become unattainable for young families. And it's their only option, is their only alternative is to go and buy an apartment um, rather than buying a house because it's just not an option for a lot of young families. But in, in Melbourne, what I, I think's happened is unfortunately a lot of the family market, a lot of the young couples have gone and bought houses, let us say inner north, inner west, because it's still affordable. And they haven't been forced to buy apartments. The other problem with, with Sydney... Although Brisbane, that is, I should say that is starting to... That gap is starting to close, though. That that you know, the door is starting to close on that, wouldn't you say? Because yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, and I can see that already happening in Melbourne because you know you're starting to see all the areas that were affordable to young families in Melbourne. You know, the inner west, the inner north. Um, you have to go very deep along uh, down the bayside, almost to Frankston. You've got to go very fast, far east if you want a house. And so some families will start be making that decision. I don't want to go to Geelong. I don't want to go to Mornington. I can't afford a house around the city. Maybe I should just go and buy a bigger, older apartment in my dream suburb. And so I'd rather live in the Brightons or the Camberwell or, you know, the premium parts of Melbourne where I can't afford a house, but I've got a really nice apartment. And so if I was buying an apartment in Melbourne, those are the apartments I would want. I'd want the bigger, older apartments, things that would suit family. Now, I know... um, Miriam, you mentioned that you, you know, you're looking to buy just for your needs. But I think when you're buying any property, you've got to think about who would you sell this to if you ever decide to sell. And so if you can afford it, I definitely want to try to get an apartment that suits a family, even if you're not planning on having that. Also, it suits what you mentioned, downsizing, you know, thinking about your retirement. You know, if you could get an apartment that's amazing for, you know, someone downsizing within, you know, Camberwell or Brighton. Um, also, it's great for a young family, you know, because it's quiet, the little block, maybe it's not too many stairs for both of those. Um, it's also good for singles because they could rent out a spare bedroom. Um, it's also good, you know, etc. And you're thinking about who would you sell it to. I think it's a, it's a really good move. And that's what's happening in Melbourne. So firstly, they haven't had the demand shift there. 
Um, and secondly, they've had an enormous amount of supply. You know, the reality is it's a flat city with pretty relaxed planning controls and they have just built apartments for fun. And they'll continue to build a lot of apartments down in Melbourne. It's just easy to do. The same in Brisbane and the same as a lot elsewhere. So you've got to be super care careful around the long-term supply problem of apartments in Melbourne and buy in areas where they're not building many more apartments. And if they are building apartments, they're super expensive. They're way more than what um, the current other apartments in other areas are. And they're really expensive, almost like houses because they're not building, they're not competing with the apartment that you own. Um, and there'd be parts of Melbourne where house prices are four, you know, maybe three or four times the cost of apartments. It's definitely the case in Sydney. You know, an apartment in Bellevue Hill might be one to 1.5, but houses are four, five, six million. You know, same as Darling Point, same as Bondi. Um, so you want the apartment price to be, you may be in 20 to 30% of the price of the house. It's a really good sign that um, people can't afford the houses and so they'll have to afford the apartments one day. So um, that's probably my advice, Miriam. If, you, if you're thinking about buying an apartment, buy in those areas where they're not building anymore, which Veronica talked about, really suits families because their houses are way too expensive um, and also suits the downsizers within that area. You know, someone in, in, in Brighton um, gets their 50s and 60s, they're over the maintenance of a house and they just say, you know what, why don't we just downsize to a two bed in the area We'll free up a few million dollars, put that in our super fund, um, and then have this little lockup in a cute little street, and we don't have to leave our friends and our family and our networks. And so I think in 10 years' time, you'll find a lot of people will be doing that in suburbs. So hopefully that answers your question. Um, and yeah, definitely avoid all those things you were talking about, you know, the, the busy roads and um, and the new apartments. You already sound like you're on the money, to be honest. You've talked about the top floor apartment, um, northerly sun, privacy, greenery, views. These things do matter, right? These are the things, if someone's got to compromise living in a house to live in an apartment, these are the things they're gonna look for. The top floor is a little bit of a worry, I guess, with a lift, um, and whether that rules out families and downsizers. Um, maybe it's lots of stairs, let's say. Um, but I also have the attitude, if you're gonna buy an apartment block, you wanna to try to buy the, one of the best apartments in that block, just because you never know when things could go bad and in terms of the economy and you, and you could easily see fire sales within a building. Um, this happened in 2018. And if yours is one of the, the, the bottom 30, 40% of the quality of the apartments in the block, it doesn't take much for someone above you to sell really fast and then the whole building gets repriced and you're cheaper than whatever that is. So try to buy in the top 25% of the, the quality apartments in the block. I do think that matters long-term and you always get pushed up from a better sale rather than push down if, if a sale is not great. So, um, yeah, that's another tip for you. Um, okay, so a couple of things that I've observed in Sydney because, of course, Sydney is, yes, less affordable or more expensive, um, the most expensive uh, city in Australia. Um, it hasn't had the same issues with oversupply that Melbourne has had. However, it does in areas and it Continue, will continue to do so. It's just that I don't think this has been as widespread, the impact of the, all the heavy development in Sydney in terms of the apartment space. I don't think this has been as widespread in its impact on other apartments throughout the city, which is what Chris is talking about. And a large part of that comes down to the affordability piece. There's also geographical constraints on Sydney that there aren't in Melbourne. Now, yeah. one thing I have noticed very recently, and this is very, very recent, I have noticed three bedroom, and I've been sort of saying for some time, I do feel like three bedroom apartments are an opportunity for investors. Um, not just for investors, but even if you want to buy one to live in. And that is because of exactly that, that the as families are priced out of houses and they don't want to leave the city, um, COVID notwithstanding, they are, will be forced to look at apartments. And I have seen that happen in recent, very recent months where buyers, and, and I'm talking in inner Sydney here, where, where really if a buyer has, say, 2.2, 2.3, you would think, oh, God, $2.3 million, surely I could find a house, you know, with three bedrooms in it quite easily. But it's actually a very difficult price point. And 
We have seen people go to apartments and push the prices of three-bedroom apartments up way more and a real just a, a like an injection of value increase in that, that certain types of apartments. All of a sudden, it's like everyone's decided, they met around the corner and decided we're all going to pivot from houses to apartments on the same day and all of a sudden, bang. Then so that sort of happened and you go, okay, right, well, they've given up on the house. They've given up on owning the house and now going and they're going to compete for those three-bedroom apartments and obviously then they have a big uplift in value. The next layer of that, the next iteration of that is the good two-bedders. Now, two-bedrooms are often investor stock. You know, it's the sort of thing that a lot of those those big complexes, they're full of two and ones, you know, that basically are all built cookie cutter style and and expected to rent out easily, right? And so if you're buying a two-bedroom apartment, you've got to be super careful that you're not buying something that is investor stock. You're not buying something cookie cutter. Whereas the three bedders, it's easier to avoid because there's less three bedrooms around. There's less built in the first place. There's loads, shitloads of two bedrooms out there. So what we've been seeing is those two bedders with something a bit extra. So they've got high ceiling or maybe they're in a in a warehouse conversion or maybe they're um, a two level apartment and you know each bedroom's got a balcony or they've got something that's different about them. Those now are going gangbusters because it's almost like the people priced out of the three bedroom apartments and are turning to those. They're saying, right, if it's got a study alcove, I'll live with that instead of a third bedroom. And all of a sudden, and those sort of larger two-bedroom apartments, they've had an injection into their value and I've seen some crazy prices for them. The next layer of that now I'm seeing one bedrooms. Now, honest to God, one bedrooms are so on the nose from, from lockdown, um, it's not funny. However, you know, when you start seeing bigger one bedders that effectively have the living space of a two bedroom, you know, so it's a real comfortable one bedroom. So we're talking sort of, you know, 70 square meters and above, you know, for an apartment. Now, a lot of two-bedders are the same size. So when you see a one-bedder like that, we are starting to see that the people that are escaping the city, the people that are going to do the sea and tree change, are wanting their city bolt hole, and these bigger one-bedrooms all of a sudden are starting to see an injection in value, you know. So this is the knock-on effect of affordability, and the people that were looking for the two bedrooms are priced out of it now because of that sudden inflation of, of value. They don't want to buy the cookie cutter one. So they're going to the next level down, which is a really good one better. So it's like the cream of the crop of each of these back to that stratification, you know, the, the median stratif- the stratification of, a, of a, um, a suburb. The cream of the crop in each of the market segments are seeing quite significant price rises and they're decoupling from the rest of the crap in in the same segment. And so back to data, the data itself isn't going to really properly show that because all of the data for two-bedroom apartments is mixed in together. And so you really do need to, back on what Chris was saying, to really get in there and understand what's happening on the ground so that you can choose wisely and start to read these trends, start to read what is really in demand with buyers and and actually start handpicking the sort of property you want to own, which has got these special elements to them. So even in a situation in Melbourne where over a period of time, loads of development has flattened apartment price growth across the city, in amongst all of that, if you you start picking the eye teeth out of it, you will start to see the sorts of properties that ultimately affordability in each price segment will push peak buyers into and they'll be the ones that get picked up first and they'll be the ones that have the prices pushed up. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, as you, you say there around the one betters, it's so true, but it's definitely going to be the really bigger ones, the ones that are almost feel like a two bed. Um, you know, because if, you know, young couples look at them, you know, they look at their relationship and go, could we survive here, right? Um, or if it's a single that may be made a couple, then they, you know, they get a longer runway. Um, and, you know, they think, well, we could stay here for six years before we have kids, you know, if I meet someone, etc. cetera. So, um, and then you've got those people who are downsizing and just want a boat hole in the city. Um, you know, the Airbnb impact as well is, is starting to get in the more investor stock in the one beds as well. And so they'll rent better. So, Absolutely, it's the cream of the crop. People will naturally cascade down. And um, I think people are sort of thinking, oh, maybe that this will run out of steam. Well, it won't because unfortunately what I think is really, well, not unfortunately, but what will drive apartment prices to the next level is migration. Most people, like most of my clients, we've got heaps of clients from all over the world. I'd probably say even more, I don't know the numbers, are actually born overseas than born in Australia. We've just got an amazing diverse culture of clients 
Um, and all the ones generally that are, besides one at the moment actually, who's moving um, to Central Coast, but all the, from Europe, all around the world, they've grown up in apartments. They're comfortable in apartments. They know, they haven't even got their hot eyes set on a house. They just don't think it's achievable and they don't even want it anyway. They just want a really nice apartment and they just want to be in the action. They don't want to be living in the middle and outer rings, etc. And they just want to be around the harbour. They living in Sydney to live Sydney life, for example. I'm living in Melbourne to live Melbourne life. And so when migration kicks off over the next 20 to 30 years, we'll still have a lot of people moving in from around the world and they're going to want to live in nice apartments and they're going to grow, you know, a lot of that migration is going to go there as well. So um, that's not happening at the moment, but it will definitely happen in the next five years once the borders are open and they hit the turbo button. So we have another question around apartments, but a completely different angle here from Zach. He said he's currently renting a two-bedroom in uh, Surrey Hills, Sydney, and wanting to make the next move in property. Been hearing quite a lot lately about people moving or upgrading their current living situation for lifestyle reasons and wondering what our views are on the so-called lifestyle co compounds. Examples that spring to mind is Wanda Kaya, I think that's how you pronounce it, in Lower North Shore, Balmain Shores, I know that very well, and Abbotsford Cove in the Inner West. And there's even entire suburbs turned into median density lifestyle compounds. Although many units in these compounds are still cookie cutter apartments, my understanding is that some have distinct scarce features you often talk about, such as unique floor plans, views, access to excellent amenities, etc. Would we consider these to be uh, investment grade? Well, what do you think about that one, Chris? I don't like them. Um, you know, you may have a scarce one in there. You may have the top floor with the northerly views. I just think that unless that apartment block um, is really uh, super aspirational, it's got some type of really lifestyle benefit that you get living in that apartment block over other apartment blocks. Um, and the demographics within that apartment block is definitely suiting a lot of families and, um, and it's got some really wow factor about it. Um, but even still, you've got a lot of apartments. Um, sometimes they've got massive piece of land as well. So if you cut up the land in between those apartments, it's still a fair chunk of land per apartment. But if I had to compare that versus a, a, a six block of units on a quiet street and you getting the best one in those six block of units versus these big lifestyle compounds, um, I would absolutely go the older stock um, any day of the week. I just think you've got um, you know, too many apartments um, you know, too many supply, always other people selling in the, the apartment complex. And I think you'll get dragged down because a lot of buyers will be looking at it and going, well, if that one sold for 980, why would I pay 1.4 for yours? You know, because it's still a three bed and it's still in the same compound. And so I think you just don't get that scarcity in terms of at the sale. Um, whereas if you've got a block of six, there might only be two or three other apartments in the whole area that compete with you and you've got the best apartment and sky's the limit, really. You can suck up all the demand. And so... There's lots of reasons. Sometimes you get big body corporate as well. I'd be watching out for that. Like what is the cost for all those services in these compounds, the gardens, the concierge, the pool, the tennis court, blah, blah, blah. So um, just watch out for the body corporate and definitely you want to be any of these type of new builds. I'd be wanting to look at that strata report um, and just be super careful that there's no special levies, et cetera, um, with these buildings. I think one of the things around these co these lifestyle compounds and these sort of resort style complexes is that time will tell. Um, and Chris is talking about in some of these bigger buildings, there's always something for sale. And you know, and so the difference is tightly t tightly held um, properties versus or buildings and complexes versus those where there's always something for sale. And so that is something, as I said, time will tell. You, these, the community around these properties and these, these buildings and these complex and the facilities and the way they run and the way that they sort of evolve over time, it can't be completely designed. You know, it's all well and good to have it on paper and build this thing. It looks lush. It looks like a resort. But if, if actually the right sort of people you know, and their right connection and, and cohort of people don't move into there and actually take it to the next level, which is that whole community thing, um, then it won't ever get that stickiness around it, right? So, and it's an organic thing. These things you can, on paper, the, some of these developments, I've seen them and they've been brand new and you think, oh my God, they'd be amazing. It's so beautiful. It's on the water, a lot of them on the water. A lot of them are aimed at downsizers from sort of those big family homes at North Shore and Sydney, for argument's sake. Um, but it's only once people start moving in that you start to see, well, really what's the experience they're living there? And 
I tell you what, like it's interesting that uh, it mentions Balmain Shores because in Balmain, for instance, along the Parramatta River there, there's three complexes that sort of roughly-ish the same sort of age, right? There's one called Hope Town Keys in uh, Birch Grove and they've got three-level waterfront townhouses and they've all got, you know, marina burrs and and then there's these apartments and townhouses up the up the top. Then there's the next one along, which is Balmain Cove, and they've got some really enormous apartments in there. Same deal with its own marina and boating and blah blah blah. And then you've got Balmain Shores, which is the next one along, which is the newest of the lot. It doesn't have a marina. Um, and it's probably the biggest and it's probably got the, the highest level of smaller apartments in it as well. So that's the one I'd avoid for starters because it, it, if you look at those three different buildings or three different complexes, the one thing it doesn't have that the other two have are marina burrs, right? So that's, and also that their apartments are generally smaller. So there's a lot more of them. So therefore a lot more tenants, a lot more churn, and there's always a lot more for sale in that complex. Down to the other end, the Hopetown Keys, they're actually terribly designed. Three level, um, you know, so Balmain Shore, Balmain Cove, the middle one, it, it focused less on the townhouses. All their townhouses are up in street level, so they're more like houses, right? Whereas all the waterfronts are actually multiple level apartment buildings, but each apartment has wide, they're wide, they're big, they're oversized, which means for downsizers to live in them don't need to put a lift in their own townhouse. You know, like it's sort of really well designed with the downsizer in, in mind. You know, you once you get in your apartment, you don't have to go anywhere basically. And you've got these lovely expansive views, whereas Hopetown Keys on the same waterfront offering marina facilities, so you could say it's similar, but the access to each townhouse is a real nightmare and when you get inside, they're over three levels. So they don't have the same expansiveness, they don't have the same level of access. So then you've got three very different lifestyle compounds within the same basic stretch of water, three adjoining suburbs, but you know you could call it one, it's just on the one peninsula. You know, three very different experiences and when one comes on the market, I can tell you which one sells better. It's the Balmain Cove ones, the bigger apartments with the better views, um, you know, offering sort of the best of everything. So so there's a good example, I guess, of, uh, you know, they're all designed or all, you know, had some clever person designing them in the first place. It's sort of, it's what's designed in the facil- in there in terms of facilities, but also the types of people that are attracts and then fundamentally the actual community that, that grows from that. So... And I guess the other thing too, I'd be questioning whether you even think about investment grade in this context because these are really aimed at the owner occupier. So, you know, and and in in itself, and that's the weird thing about investment grade, we talk about owner occupiers are the people pushing up prices, you know, not investors. So we we talk and that in, in a way the investment grade, the term is is sort of a bit misleading, really, because that's not targeted investors at all. And it probably is a you know, yeah. potentially a better investment. If you like what you're hearing here, please share this episode with others you feel would benefit. And while you're at it, why not leave us an iTunes review? Five stars, please. Every review helps make it easier for other people to find us and hear what our amazing guests have to say. We love hearing your questions and we're planning more listener Q&A episodes. Please send your questions in. You can send them via the website, which is theelephantintheroom.com.au or directly via email to questions at theelephantintheroom.com.au. Yeah, exactly. It's owner, owner occupier grade, uh, which is what you buy as an investor is the stuff that suits them. Um, and uh, and absolutely, that's the big mistake, right? Investors buy what other investors buy. Um, you know, investors spruik as a property, just you know, get all the investors together and they go and buy all these high density apartments, or they go and buy all these house and land packages and duplexes in southeast Queensland, or. You know, the list goes on of um, where investors all get in a group and it's the worst thing you probably want because it's not driven by owner occupiers. Um, the big thing I think with these, anything that's sort of new um, is it ages fast. Um, look at cars, cars that are 10 years old. Like they do, they look a lot older than 10 years old and they age really fast. It's the same as apartments. Like if you go to an apartment that's five years old, um, I think you'll think that it's a lot older than it is. And these apartments are a lot of, and a lot of these lifestyle compounds, I've had a look online, they're getting old, you know, they're 20, 30 years old, um, you know, and they need a good reno to bring it up to something that's modern. And it's not going to be cheap to do that on a big building. And so I feel like if you get something that's like an old Art Deco, etc., it never loses its sort of Charm. appeal. 
right? It mm. never loses it. Or you can, you can paint it, uh, and I feel like in 100 years' time, it's still a solid brick. Uh, it's still got higher ceilings. It's got great features. If anything, it gets even more desirable over time. Um, we just don't build them like that anymore. And, and unfortunately, over the last 30 years, we've bought, built a hell of a lot of stuff that's just going to age. And it's just going to get worse and worse and worse. So I think you're buying a ticking time bomb buying these, to be honest. Uh, something that's aging fast is going to have a lot of repairs. It's not that desirable in terms of versus something that's an old Art Deco just up the road. Maybe it's a little bit more expensive. But that being a little bit more expensive today, I think it'll be a lot more expensive in the future. So, um, yeah, hopefully that answers your question there, Zach. <laughs> it just reminds me, only last week I went and had a look at an, uh, an apartment in Breakfast Point. So a client was quite keen on me going to have a look at it. And, and look, I know we've looked at some townhouses in Breakfast Point in previous years for clients and some of them are actually very nice. But this is actually the first time I've been in an apartment there. And I could tell from the photo that it's basically looked in on all windows by other apartments, right? But I, I said I'd go and have a look because these people are actually in, in a lockdown LGA as well. So I went and had a look <laughs> when I drove in there. It, it's a while since I've been there and I was overwhelmed by the feeling that you're driving into a film set. Like Breakfast Point is an enormous suburb and it's a complete master plan suburb. You know, talk about these these entire suburbs that are sort of de designed like these communities. And and you do your drive in and it's it's all fake. It's all meant to look like the Hamptons, basically, but it's it's so overwhelmingly fake. And it's all same, same, same. Every building looks the same. And and I ooh, that to me makes me cringe. I can't stand that, you know, it, because of course I I guess I, I I'm so different to everybody else. You know, the, you're all individuals, or I'm not, that thing. But clearly these these people there's a market for it. Obviously, at the point at which it was developed, people went, yeah, I love that idea, and they moved in there. But these things do date, like Chris is saying. Hamptons will go out of out of fashion. You know, one of these days Hamptons is going to go out of fashion and that entire suburb is going to be dated. <laughs> it's a bit like the red brick, you know, you're, anyway. It's, so, it's a very good point. But, yeah, I had this sort of visceral reaction when I drove in. I was like, oh, I've forgotten how same, 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 same it is. It's like going becoming a Stepford wife. Yeah. Yeah, and that's a good warning sign. If you buy anything is looking the same, you're like, oh, what's the scarcity here, you know? And even if you've got, like, I'm looking at a lot of people who've got apartments, um, you know, say in like, a, say Alexandria, right, or Waterloo, they go, I've got a, the best apartment there. Well, yeah, but you've still got hundreds or tens of thousands of apartments still around you and buyers are still comparing. And yes, you know, they may, there is a small subset that will, you know, comparing them to houses within the suburbs. And yes, there are those, but ultimately you still got to look around and think there's a lot of apartments around you. And so, um, yeah, I just think with anything that looks like that, uh, keep looking, Zach, I think you can do better. <laughs> okay, third question is from Philip. Myself and my partner are looking to buy in Victoria for our first home with a pre-approval scheduled for November. We have not approached any professions yet, just researching via podcasts, articles and books. Good on you. Burning question. Regarding the upfront deposit which you're required to pay after you win at auction, what happens if the deal does not go ahead due to finance or other factors outside of um, contract. I'm not sure that what he means by that, but um, do you lose your deposit or a percentage of it? Are there any laws to protect consumers in this position? We are unsure about the process and quite intimidated by auctions. If we were to lose our deposit on the basis of an auction purchase not going ahead, could you please run through the process and key factors we should understand when paying a deposit after winning at auction? Philip, you should never lose your deposit. The reality is you should be doing all your due diligence and make sure that you've got finance approval prior to even bidding at auction. Are there people who lose their deposit? Yeah, probably. People who haven't got their ducks lined up, people who have just bid, bought something without finance approval, um, thing, people who have bought things like um, where they've got really low valuations like new apartments and um, you know, off the plan sector. Um, which you know, tend not to go to auction, so. Yeah, which, yeah exactly. Um, but the reality is people wouldn't be having the guts to go and bid hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars, sometimes millions and millions of dollars um, with the risk of losing their deposit. No sane person is going to go and risk all their life savings bidding at auction um, if they didn't think it, was a, it, it wasn't going to be a risk. So the number one thing you need to be doing here, Philip, is doing your due diligence prior to you know bidding at auction, really. And it comes down to two things. One is making sure that your finance is going to be 100% no issues. 
and a good mortgage broker can really check your situation. And, and with, a, with a client we, we get, for example, there's usually two types. There's clients where there's something about their situation that makes it a little bit tricky. So something maybe around their income, maybe around their savings. It could be something on their credit file. Um, it could be a visa. Um, it could be that there's, there's something around them that means not every lender will lend to them and there'll be a small number of lenders that will lend to them and sometimes only one or two. And for them, you've got to be really careful what they do because if they stuff it up, for example, that bank says no, then there's only one other option or there's no other options. And so a good broker will tell you, hey, there's an issue with this situation here. This is the only bank we can go with and then they're okay with it and you've got to be very delicate. And in that situation, maybe you want a cooling off and maybe you don't want to go to auction. But if you're not in that situation, you're in the other camp where there's probably lots of lenders that will lend to you. And then it's just a case of really making sure that it's an actual pre-approval. It's not done by a computer. There's nothing to be concerned about. You know you've got the savings. Um, and then it comes down to making sure you just don't go crazy at the auction. I mean, that's the truth of it. And that's really where you, you just really got to make sure that there's other sales in the suburb that are selling at a similar price. The bank's not going to go and say, you should have paid... 595,000 for that, but you paid 605, so you've overpaid by 10,000. The bank will never do that. They will just go in and say, look, 605, yeah, there's a couple other properties selling at 600-ish. Okay, let's just sign that off. The valuer doesn't want to create a fight. They just want to tick the box and prove that you paid a fair price, not what it's actually worth. The bank doesn't look at it like that they, when you purchase. They just want to say, look, it's a fair price in the current market. Um, let's move on to the next valuation. They, they get their $200 and they go to another one. So, Philip, you should never get yourself in that position. I understand it's a big concern. We've had lots of clients and it is a concern for everyone, right? Especially first-time buyers who have never been down the process before and it's every single dollar they've saved years and years and years for. But absolutely, you should never get yourself in that situation. The reality is there's not much to protect you because at auction, you're buying under unconditional contract with 60 days or 42 days to settle. And if you don't come up with the cash, then absolutely they can take the whole deposit. So, yes. And let me just sort of explain what auction means too. When you buy a property at auction, you're buying without a cooling off period, right? You're under auction conditions mean there is no cooling off. You can't back out. So, so whereas you can go and make an offer and in different states, this is different as well. In Victoria, you can make conditional offers if they'll accept them. But if it's an auction campaign, it's unlikely, very, very, very unlikely they're going to accept it, right? So, um, and in a hot market, more property goes to auction than, than is offered uh, a private treaty. And also the the buyer has more flexibility in terms of the conditions that they can put on an offer in a in a slow market, right? In a hot market, the buyer has very little flexibility. So you've got to understand the market conditions that you're buying in. But when you're buying at auction, there is no cooling off period. So you have to, as Chris says, have your finance approved and all your due diligence done and worked out what it's really worth to you and what's a reasonable price to pay before you go to the auction. There's no point going to the auction and then afterwards making a mad, panicked, awfully stressful scramble to try to actually find out whether you can actually complete that purchase. So that's the first thing to understand. Yes, what, if what you are actually committing to if you bid at auction and if you end up being the highest bidder and it's over reserve. In different states, once again, um, there are different requirements for a deposit. So in New South Wales, the standard is 10%. If you require less than 10%, you need to make a request and that is done pre prior to the auction, not at the auction, and you ask for a lesser deposit and 5% is the minimum that p people will accept. And if that's agreed to, then, you know, you can offer 5%. There's usually a clause in the contract that actually says that if you default, they'll come back after you for the, the balance. So you, you offer the 10% the plus there could be other consequences if you default as well, because if the market falls, for instance, and somebody else, they subsequently sell it to somebody else who pays less than what your highest bid was, they can come after you for the difference. So another reason to be very, very careful before you bid, right? You are make, you're entering into a contract. Now, in Victoria, it's different. It's not standard uh, 10%. There's no actual default um, agreed uh, amount of deposit. So 
ask the agent at the outset or get your lawyer or conveyancer to actually agree on the deposit amount. So there's a, there is an amount you have to pay. You have to pay a deposit, but it's not like your 20% deposit you save up or you're trying to save up if you're buying your first home or your 10% or whatever. It's it's the deposit to, to secure the sale. So in terms of consideration for the contract. Now, so that has to be agreed in advance. So there's a lot of things that you need to do to prepare for auction um, and be ready before you bid. And so if you learn all those things that you need to do, then you're going to be less fearful about losing your deposit because you'll be better prepared and you'll understand your obligations. Now, what I would suggest to you, a couple of things, I wrote a whole book on this, right? <laughs> so if you want to, there's, we'll put the link in the show notes. You can buy the book. Um, we even give you a 30% discount for listeners to the elephant. You just use the elephant. Elephant is the code at the checkout. Use elephant and you get 30% off. Buy the book. It will take you through that process. And the other thing too, Home Buyer Academy, of course, you know, that's my sidekick, um, sorry, my side hustle, is um, is designed to help first home buyers understand everything step by step you need to do. And one of the things that we offer in Home Buyer Academy is a free course to help you learn how to price a property so you're less at risk of overpaying and getting out of whack of whatever the valuation might be. So um, we'll put the link for that free mini course in the show notes as well. So there's some really practical things that you can do to prepare yourself um, along with what Chris is saying about your finance and getting that sorted and that's absolutely critical. Yeah, we've seen a few issues recently. Um, you know, even one just last month, a client came to us, they went to an online lender, um, they bought a house down in the Sutherland Shire actually. Um, and I don't know why what happened, but Basically, the valuation came in low and they bought at auction. Um, and, you know, they thought it was worth 1.4 something and it was like 1.3. Um, and we scrambled um, for them. We got it sorted. Everything's fine, you know. But the problem is, is they didn't have a broker. They'd gone to an online lender. Um, and, you know, because they thought it was a cheaper rate, we ended up getting them better fixed rates by some distance from what they were offering and people fixing at the moment. So it worked out even financially beneficial to use us versus an attractive variable rate that they were potentially going for. Um, but what we were able to do is figure out, you know what, there's nothing wrong with your situation here. You're a super great borrower. I reckon this is just a bad valuation. And this very rarely happens, but in this situation, it did happen. And whether the I just don't even know why it happened, but we got this bad valuation, and I just it happens the- because value is a human. Exactly, and I don't know. What, and I, I also think that maybe they didn't attach the contract to the valuation request. Something so simple like that, the value might have gone round and just said, "Oh, I think it's worth one point three two, not one point four something." Right? Um, and we just don't know what happened. We haven't even seen the valuation, but we were able to solve that issue by just going, "You know what? You could go to any bank." We can just lodge two valuations right now today. We'll do one with CBA. We did one with Westpac. I'm pretty sure it was those banks or whatever. Um, and it was all sold within a couple of days. And so the real issue there was, you know, they just didn't have someone who was there to backfight their corner if an issue popped up. Now, this was a valuation issue, but it could have also been a lot of, um, I don't know, another recently a client um, with this COVID situation, her work situation's changed. You know, and we were able to scramble. She's got a piece of land that they're purchasing. We were able to scramble through bank policy and go, right, no, you're still okay at this bank. Um, and so something had changed after they, and then we had to be able to shift, et cetera. And so a good broker will do that. And it's the same as whether you go direct to a bank. You know, we had a client recently where they were working with CBA Direct um, at the branch and the the personal banker there was completely stuffing up their servicing. They've been thinking they could borrow a lot less than they could actually borrow. And they've been chasing the market for many months um, and thinking that they can only spend high ones, they could actually spend even low to mid twos. And the CBA banker just didn't understand how to do a servicing calculator properly. They came to us through a referral from a buyer's agent and we're able to say, you know what, everything's wrong. You can actually borrow a lot more. Now that CBA banker, you know, bless them, they didn't really know, it's not their fault, but they just didn't understand. Um, and CBA's got the most ser- best servicing as well out there pretty much. So it wasn't a bank problem, it was actually just they didn't know how to use their own bank servicing calculator. Um, Human and error. So, yeah, and it's it, that was costing them a lot of money and they admit it, they went to auctions many times and just kept blowing out even though they had more budget in them. The other thing the CBA banker was, and this is not a fight against CBA, this could have been any banker, but they were sending them RP data reports 
no. and saying that's what you should be bidding to at auction. Oh, um, no. And they were bidding at auction up to the UPI data report because they thought that that's what the bank would value it at. And they, the CBA banker didn't explain that to them. So do uh, absolutely do home uh, a home buyer course uh, academy and you know, and I think that's really valuable. Read the book, etc., but also get your great broker. Absolutely. Because, you know, these are the things that pop up when you try to outsmart the system yourself because you go to a rate or you go direct to the bank or etc. When things hit the fan, you need someone who can really digest things and go, right, no, this is the solution. This is the bank. This is what we're going to do. And so a great broker will be able to do that for you. One hundred percent agree. And in fact, in your first home by guide, which is our course, you know, there's 10 phases that we take people through. And the very first one is to assemble your support crew. And one of those people has to be a broker, a really good broker. Like as Chris was just explaining, one example or a couple examples there really of of how having a broker involved earlier rather than later is so important. Um, And, you know, we could have entire, actually, maybe we should have an entire episode on why getting a broker involved even before you're ready to buy would be, would be a good thing to do because any broker that's not willing to talk to you before you're actually ready, um, then ditch them, go and find one that will talk to you because there's so many things, so many ways that a good broker can advise you even at at the, you know, in your preparation phase, let alone when you get to the pointy end. But that's, you know, you've just shown great example there, Chris, of, of why someone who understands the system, you know, you need that on your side. It's very, very complicated out there. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we have this one this week, you know, and this is just in the last couple of weeks, this is just popping up, you know, a credit issue. They just didn't even know they had a default on their file. Um, and so people were doing, you know, it was a credit card, a different address, three addresses of home with a little fight between the husband and wife when they found out they were all upset. But we went to a credit repair agency, you know, we've got a contact that, you know, within five days, it's off their credit file. You know, it's obviously a mistake. Obviously, it was an issue. But if they lodged a loan at any bank, it would have been auto decline. And you get three or two of those, your credit file drops. Then you can't go to any of the big banks. Your credit score is well under 700. Then you have to start to no banks and you have to pay interest and it all get really messy. And so just things like that. A good broker will do a credit check on you straight away and say, no, no issues there. You're fine. Next step, etc." cetera. So, um, yeah, I don't want to bang on about brokers too much. But I think it's this huge value there, especially when you, your confidence has got to be around there bidding a lot of money at auction. Um, a good broker, he steps in there and says, look, everything's fine from a bank point of view. There's nothing to be concerned about here. And then a good buyer's agent will help you negotiate and obviously value that property there. They work hand in hand at that key point in time. Yeah. Now, our last sort of, it's sort of a question. It's more a discussion points from Tony. Um, I think he's probably our um, biggest fan. We love you, Tony. (laughs) He says that your episodes on homelessness and your general decent approach, thank you, to thinking about housing from different points of view, homes, investments, shelter, et cetera, is refreshing. And in fact, um, you know, if this does interest you, go and listen to episode 191 where we're we're interviewing Michelle Adair from the Housing Trust. Um, Now, on the topic of social housing, he had a thought which he says might be silly and perhaps has limited application. I just thought we'd just have a very quick discussion because who knows what we can open up here and who knows where this may even lead. A couple of years ago, I bought an investment property in southern Tasmania on 15 acres. On one of the visits down, I met a lady in her 50s also living in a van. This bothers me. What would be the possibility of linking willing landowners and tiny houses built by people learning trades, subsidised by government or philanthropy? Under the right conditions, I'd be happy to let someone stay on my land in a defined space until they moved on or whatever, and then the rights for that space reverted back. It wouldn't, it wouldn't solve city homelessness, no, but, you know, it's, it's an interesting concept. And I just wonder really if we're just throwing it open for conversation here. Chris, have you ever sort of thought about this sort of thing? Uh, yeah, I mean, ultimately, if you've got land um, and you want to basically, you should you should be able to do whatever you want on that land, right? You think that's the way it works. <laughs> I but, should, but no. But the reality is it doesn't work like that, right? Uh, I think good old Pete Evans, and don't, don't worry, we probably shouldn't talk about this because I don't know much about it, but I think he got rejected just this week because he was sort of trying to create a little commune sort of community up in byron um and they were going to do pretty much what you spoke about you know a lot maybe a bit more than 15 acres lots of different people and create this sort of village within this piece of land utopia i think he's trying to create yeah but i mean obviously the locals and the 
a council are going to step in and say, hang on a sec, this completely changes the purpose of residential. You're allowed one dwelling. Um, and if we allowed everyone to have five dwellings, then it changes the whole suburb and maybe it's agricultural land, etc. So I think you're going to find you're going to have some issues there. Um, you might get away with this though, is uh, if they're in vans, are they really structures? Um, and, you know, can you get around something there? So let's say, um, you know, potentially they're not actually permanent structures. And so maybe you can have a lot more than the one dwelling. So, um, and, and can solve this problem on, in, a, in a way. So um, absolutely, I think it's uh, people giving back their land to communities. I've definitely seen this in the environmental space. I can't, I can't remember the, the word for it, but they say, well, we've got a lot of land here, but we're gonna give it back to conservation companies. I still own it but then they can plant trees and then they can increase, uh, et cetera. So things like that are happening. And I'd like to see that happen for the communities absolutely as well, where people say, I don't need this land. I still want to own it, but I'm going to give it back to the community to use it. And then when I want it back, I'll just sort of, um, they can sort of move on, I guess. But um, yeah, I think it's, it's, a, it's a good thought, but I just wonder whether the councils are, are on this sort of path as well. I think that's what it requires. It requires going to your local council and finding out what the appetite is there, you know, what, how, they, um, how they're measuring the issue, the problem. Um, are, they, are they doing anything about it themselves or are they just not even acknowledging it? Is there a problem or is it just one person in the van? I, I, don't, I don't know. I'm just suggesting that, um, that I think that, you know, for concerned people who have a resource that potentially could help, I think it's about, about gathering together and actually going to council and talking to because that's the first line of you know that's that's really the first objection you're going to have in terms of use of land you know they're going to want they're going to be the ones that stomping all over you because you're not getting their rates paid or or there's not the infrastructure or whatever on that thing about the trees though I've heard some pretty you know really cynical stories about people who um, you know like. Companies like airlines, right? So you pay extra to get a carbon offset when you buy a ticket. You know, there's days when you could actually fly places. Um, so that company then has to plant a tree or have a tree or lease a tree or whatever in order to to spend the carbon offset dollars. And I've heard of all sorts of rorts being, you know, with people who do own lots of land out in outback, you know, uh, New South Wales or outback wherever with lots of trees on them and they're not planting extra trees they're just happening to get paid for the trees they have that they were never going to get rid of in the first place so you know I, that really bothers me I'm like if you're paying a carbon offset to a company I want to know they're planting a new tree not that they're actually paying somebody you know so that they can tick a box and qualify for something so they, you know that they've offset their carbon you know and this is a problem it just you know I think it's great to actually have philanthropic ways of using land if you happen to have land but let's make sure that it actually is is truly helping the problem rather than in this case being a loophole but anyway that's a different topic entirely yeah and it is a big topic and it's getting worse and worse every year right um you know we've got especially when migration grows you've got kids you know demographics um you know, issues like now with unemployment, domestic violence, like the list goes on, you know, housing, it definitely, there's a huge shelter part to it. And I think, you know, a lot of people need to be doing more for it. And I think the councils are, you know, need to sort of be looking at their, you know, one of the things I think was great in COVID last year is that car parks, for example, um, were used for the homeless, right? To, to, you know, to give them somewhere safe to be, you know, et cetera. And so I think the council has a lot to sort of to, to do here and should be doing a lot more, um, you know, with property owners and themselves looking at their current state uh, land owns um, to kind of say, oh, look, we can potentially solve some of this problem this way. And uh, through small things, big things grow. So um, good job sort of thinking about this, Tony. Yeah, but there was a developer that wasn't there a developer down in Melbourne that was a building that, that basically they were submitting DA on to redevelop. Um, and in the interim, they actually repurposed it for um, for housing homeless people. So this is there are Kate, you know, there are some some little green shoots that people actually you know popping up and saying, look, we can do something to help. Now it's a short term solution, but it's still a solution for a period of time for for a group of people. Um, so yeah, I agree that. You, but in order to do that, you have to relax some laws, some rules, <laughs> and that therein lies the problem. I think. Awesome. 
I think that's that's our final question sort of done today. I think um, if you've got any more questions, please send them through. We've been doing these a bit regular than we did in the first probably 150 episodes. So um, we really enjoy them. So please, please, please keep sending your questions through. If you're looking to buy your dream home or an investment property in Sydney's inner west, eastern suburbs or North Shore, my team and I can help you buy without regrets. Reach out via my website, gooddeeds.com.au. If you're looking to buy your first home, thinking of upgrading into a new one or purchasing an investment property anywhere in Australia, my team love to carefully guide you on this journey and most importantly, get the finance right. Reach out via our website, wealthful.com.au. Thanks for joining us. We'd love to see you again. And remember, don't be a dumbo.